The Jazz Age was a time of new music, new cultures, and new American ideals. It was the time of loose morals and violence. It was also the time of new laws, the most prominent of which being the Prohibition Act. When Prohibition came into effect, people expected prices of clothing and households to rise. They expected rents to go up as neighborhoods improved and saloons were shut down. Theater producers also expected more people to see films as a replacement of entertainment. None of those things happened. Instead, amusement and, en and entertainment industries declined. Restaurants failed without legal liquor sales. Economic effects of prohibition were largely negative. Getting rid of breweries, saloons, and so on terminated a lot of jobs. Prohibition also largely affected government tax revenues. The government had previously received 75% of state's revenue through liquor taxes. Prohibition ended up costing the government $11 billion and $300 million to enforce it. To fund these budgets, they moved to income tax revenues. The Volstead Act that was created to enforce prohibition was created with many loopholes. It was not illegal to consume alcohol or have it in your possession. It also allowed pharmacists to dispense alcohol for prescription. As a result, bootleggers ran many pharmacies to distribute alcohol. As the trade for alcohol became more popular, its quality on the black market declined and killed thousands of Americans a year. Prohibition also rose gratification in the government. Police and public officials were bribed often. Many were also lured into becoming bootleggers themselves. Prohibition allowed organized crime to flourish as America's best known, most loved, and most hated gangster affected society on a large scale. Al Capone became the symbol for the collapse of law and order in America and also gave Chicago its reputation for lawlessness. Born on January 17, 1899 in Brooklyn, New York, Al Capone started his criminal activity in his recent years of life. It would be foolish to expect such an environment to produce a moral and law-abiding youth possessing the right theories of life and success when everywhere around him he sees official lawlessness and vice in the saddle when he sees his hardworking father laboring for a few dollars a day and accumulating nothing and the bootlegger and the gambler riding in limousines. Landesco. He was a member of two kid gangs, the Brooklyn Rippers and the Forty Thieves Juniors. He dropped out of school at the age of 14, despite the fact that he was very smart. Alphonsus had countless jobs, ranging from a candy store clerk to a pinboy in a bowling alley. Later on in life, Al joined the notorious Five Points Gang. He also went to work in the Harvard Inn as a bartender and bouncer. While he worked there, Al Capone earned the famous nickname Scarface when he insulted a patron and was attacked by her brother, giving him his infamous facial scars. In 1918, Al met Mary May Coughlin at a dance. She then gave birth to his first son, Albert Sonny Francis, on December 4, 1918. Al Capone married May that same year on December 30th. While Capone was working for Frankie Yale in New York, he murdered two men, clearly demonstrating his willingness to kill. This period in time was so unbelievably corrupt that Capone was never tried for either of the murders. No one dared to admit seeing or hearing anything to do with the murders, but after putting a rival gang member in a hospital, he was sent by Frankie Yale to Chicago till things cooled down. In the year of 1919, Capone entered the corrupted city for the first time in his life. He and his family moved into a house at 7244 South Prairie Avenue. In Chicago, Capone went to work for John Torrio, Frankie Yale's old mentor. Torrio saw the potential in Capone for a great gangster. Capone was impressive in both physical prowess and cunning wit. Torrio soon had him helping in his bootlegging business. And by the middle of 1922, Al Capone had become Torrio's second-hand man. Al later became a full partner with Torrio, sharing saloons, gambling houses, and brothels. Al soon inherited the outfit when, after being shot by a rival gang, Torrio decided to leave Chicago, leaving Al to become the new big boss. Capone proved to be 10 times better at organization than John ever was. He syndicated and expanded the city's vice industry between 1925 and 1930. He controlled speakeasies, bookie joints, gambling houses, brothels, horse and racetracks, nightclubs, distilleries, and breweries at a reported income of $100 million a year. Chicago proper became the new base for Capone as he had headquarters at the Four Deuces, the, the Metropole Hotel, and the Lexington Hotel. Forest View, one of the many suburbs 
he expanded to saw a lot of violence and fear, thus earning its nickname of Caponeville. To maintain control, Capone would sometimes even bribe public officials and the police, as in Cicero. Cicero's Anton Hotel and the Hawthorne Hotel became suburban headquarters for the gangster. In order to front these headquarters, Capone pretended to be a doctor and an antique dealer. Capone maintained a five-room suite and four guest rooms at the Metropole Hotel. The hotel served as his base of operations until 1928. While location and fronts were ever important to Capone, how he made the money was just as critical. A profitable and common business of the organized criminal, such as Al Capone, was labor racketeering. This type of crime involved the infiltration of gangsters into legitimate businesses, commonly workers' unions. The power of gangs such as Capone's, which was achieved from their success in bootlegging, enabled them to make and back up the violent threats necessary to push their way into legitimate business. Anybody who was confronted by a gangster wanting in on their business. A typical example of labor racketeering would be where a gangster poses as a member of a specific union with the intent of taking it over and collecting money from the salaries of the legit members of the union, or by pilfering fractions of the member's monthly dues. The gangster would often hire substitute union members, pay them less than what they would normally be paid for their work, and pocket the difference. Because it was nearly impossible to, to differentiate among the partners, the businessman was a politician, the politician was a gangster, and the gangster was a businessman. Demaris. It was very difficult to detect and prosecute criminals involved in this type of activity. This activity was also difficult to stop because it provided the involved gangster with the front of being a legitimate worker and served as a plausible explanation for a source of income. Additionally, any opposition, such as witnesses planning to testify against gang activities or enraged union members, was immediately killed by the gangster. The involvement of gangsters with legitimate businesses was not always done against the will of the business. They infiltrated. And in some situations, the labor racketeer was called forth to improve business. Al Capone used this technique to acquire a sizable interest in the largest cleaning and dyeing plant chain in Chicago. Racketeering did not stop with infiltrating only legitimate business. Often, powerful gangs would terrorize other inferior gangs in order to steal a certain percentage of their profits. The inferior gangs found themselves faced with the proposition of either being killed and having their businesses destroyed by means such as bombing, or donating some of their proceeds to the superior gangs. Again, as in racketeering and legitimate business, these types of threats were validated through the power granted by financial success and a high degree of organization resulting from income gained from a bootlegging alcohol. Capone's gang, the mob, was notorious for this type of coercion. To his syndicate, every gambling housekeeper, handbook owner, vice resort keeper, and beer runner had to contribute a percentage of the income derived from their enterprises or risk being blown up or taken for a ride. Landesco, 80. These violent acts and threats usually could be carried out without any legal consequences, for the mob was practically immune to the law as a result of the bribery of police and politicians alike. Capone was skillful at killing his enemies once they had attained too much power. His favorite method was having men move into an apartment across from the victim and gunning him down once he stepped outside. Al's most famous murder was the St. Valentine's Day Massacre of 1929. On Thursday, February 14th, 1929, Four of his men entered a garage of bootlegger George Bugs Moran's Northside Gang's main liquor headquarters. Two of Al Capone's men came in dressed as policemen, and the rival gang members believed they were being raided by the police, so they surrendered, putting their guns down and placing their hands on the wall. They were then shot 150 times, killing six of the seven men. Al Capone, of course, had his alibi. He was not even in Chicago at the time, but instead, enjoying time at the Palm Springs Hotel in Florida. The mob also conducted complete takeovers of rival gang businesses. One example of this is how Capone stripped the gambling business away from Montaigne's. With the profits Capone enjoyed from his bootlegging activities, he could afford to pay out over half a million dollars a month to politicians for the protection of his properties, gambling joints, breweries, etc., across the city of Chicago, Landesco 81.
By bribing government officials, Capone could also order his competitors' breweries, gambling joints, and other illegal establishments to be raided and destroyed by his crooked law enforcement agents. One key politician who received part of this was Mayor William Hale Thompson. By manipulating the government in this fashion, Capone rarely troubled by police raids of his gambling establishments and succeeded in making Chicago the center of racetrack gambling in the nation. Sullivan, 183. Capone's gambling business was so closely affiliated with the law, which also benefited financially from his business, that police overlooked his slot machines, which were found in places as blatant as public as drugstores. Big Bill Thompson, two-term mayor of Chicago during the period of prime expansion of Capone's empire, provides a perfect example of political corruption operating at even the highest levels of the city. Thompson himself had connections to the Capone ring. One of his best friends was Big Jim Colosimo, head Chicago gangster at the time Capone moved to the city. Colosimo was Chicago's prostitution czar, and Big Jim was promoted to a police precinct captain by Thompson after swinging a number of votes to Thompson's side. Alsop, 204. As prohibition historian Kenneth Alsop writes, Without stretching the logical sequence too far, to Thompson may be attributed Capone's eventual terrorization of Chicago, for it was to protect the new prosperity conferred upon him by the Thompson ring that Colosimo imported Carrillo, who ran in turn, who in turn imported Capone, Alsop 204. Thompson later secured a friend in Congressman Fred London, as corrupt a politician as Thompson himself. The two even tried to take over the city's judiciary angered by the fact that some judges refused payoffs. The plan failed, however, when they were exposed by the press. This interrelationship of organized crime and criminal politics continued to grow throughout the 1920s as prohibition continued, and as it continued to be more flagrantly violated and exploited. After Thompson took a term off from 1922 to 24, the Torrio Capone machine was brought in to organize gun squads to ensure Republican victory. Thompson's return to office in 1924, Alsop 209. The police regularly were paid off by Capone's men, and in turn, they largely ignored Capone's flagrant violations of prohibition, prostitution, and gambling laws, and even the severe acts of violence that they sustained. Nonetheless, there were at least a few straight cops in Chicago. Elliot Ness, who organized a group of law enforcers later mythologized as the Untouchables, was one of them. Chicago refused to prosecute Al Capone, and he was never tried for most of his crimes. But in 1926, he was arrested for killing three people. Capone only spent one night in jail for the arrest on the murders because of insufficient evidence linking him to the crime. When he finally served time in 1929, it was for carrying a gun. And in 1930, Capone reached the peak of his power and became the city's public enemy number one. Capone and his mom had tried to pay off Elliot Ness in the beginning. After Ness refused their bribes, a newspaper article called him untouchable. The myth of the untouchables was built around the fact that Ness and his group of untouchables conducted frequent raids on Capone's breweries, often causing violent confrontations. But Ness, however, was the exception to not being pocketed by Capone, Tucker, 12. And eventually, Ness's group collected sufficient evidence against Capone Ring to send him to prison in 1931 for tax evasion for the years of 1925 to 29. Al Capone's arrest was made possible in May 1927, when the Supreme Court ruled that a bootlegger had to pay income tax on his illegal bootlegging business. The government charged that Capone owed $215,080.48 in taxes from his gambling profits and later added that he had broken prohibition laws. Capone pleaded guilty for all his charges, hoping to bargain, but, but Judge James H. Wilkerson would not make any deals. Capone then tried to bribe the jury, but Wilkerson changed the jury at the last minute. Capone was sentenced to a total of 10 years in federal prison and one year in the county jail. In addition, Capone had to serve an earlier six-month contempt of court sentence for failing to appear in court. The fines were a cumulative $50,000 and Capone also had to pay the prosecution costs of $7 million. Capone took over control of the Atlantic Federal Prison as a result he was transferred to, to Alcatraz, where security was so tight he had no knowledge of the outside world. By the time he got out of prison, his reign and hold over Chicago was long over. Capone died from cardiac arrest on Saturday, 
January 25th, 1947.